Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this discussion about Pierce County and Tacoma's real estate market. I'm Debbie Cockrell, business and development reporter for the News Tribune in Tacoma. During the pandemic, Pierce County saw home prices continue their climb as work from home options expanded and more people moved to the area and Seattleites continued to seek real estate bargains outside of King County. While prices are now coming down, interest rates have gone in the opposite direction after pandemic era lows. Listings, pending sales, and closed sales are all down from last year's numbers. We know this can be frustrating, so we've asked two real estate professionals to share what they've been experiencing as the market has shifted. Realtor John Bai is the team leader at John Bai and Associates in Kent. The office serves the greater Puget Sound region, including all of King, Pierce, Snohomish, and neighboring counties. Born and raised in the Puget Sound area, Bai has extensive market and community knowledge. Joining John today is mortgage consultant, Janeth Pannon, and she is with Penrith Home Loans in University Place. She has over 10 years of experience and has gained a deep understanding of the intricacies of mortgage lending. She is fluent in Spanish and an active member of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Thank you both for joining us. Let's get right to it. So this first question is for both of you. And we'll start with John. As the market has shifted in recent months, what are each of you seeing in your fields? Really, what exactly is going on? <laughs> so there's a lot that's going on. <clears throat> and I think to the big difference is it depends on where you live. Like even, you know, as we're talking today uh, about Tacoma and surrounding areas in Pierce County, um, there are certain pockets that are going to be performing differently than other pockets. Um, so the biggest challenge that we've seen over the last really number of years um, is the lack of, a, of inventory that's available. Um, that's really what is fueling the challenges that uh, we are seeing today. Uh, during the pandemic, I think everybody thought once we returned back to normal um, that we would have a lot more options, things would be easier, there wouldn't be as many challenge, challenges, but as uh, Janet jumps in a little bit talking more about on the mortgage side of things, um, right now it just comes down to options. If there's not a lot of options, people are gonna be staying put. So until that changes, which more than likely it probably won't, um, we are going to see a similar type market that we're in right now. Um, nice homes and nice areas priced well are going to sell fast. Um, and that's just something that uh, you need to make sure that you have professionals that are surrounding you that can help you seek good counsel and make sure the decisions that you're making um, are appropriate for um, you know what you're looking to accomplish in today's market, whether that's buying, selling or not doing either one of those. So it's kind of a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes. Jeanette, what are you seeing? So, you know, things have shifted greatly. Uh, early last year, we were starting to see sellers provide credits for buyers, right, for temporary rate buy downs, closing costs. Whereas now we're starting to see buyers be more competitive with their offers, right? Paying for their own closing costs, foregoing the buy downs, even bidding over asking price. So that tells us that inventory is still tight and demand is high. So buyers are still very motivated. Yeah. For John, um, are multiple offers still happening or is that a thing of the past? And add to that, what's the average number of days that you're seeing on the market right now compared to last year? Yeah. So it boils down to the question is the answer to that is yes and no. But I would say that a uh, number of years ago, or 18 months ago, really, you know, everything that you put up for sale sold. It was it was just a guess about how many offers are we going to get and how fast is it going to sell. Now, right now, we're seeing some houses where they are receiving multiple offers, just not as many. So there was times where we'd have 10, 15, 20, 30 offers on a property. That's not really happening anymore. Now, we can see sometimes, though, one or two, and they, but you might not see them as aggressive as they were before. So before, there'd be no financing contingency, waiving inspection, pretty much as is. Here's my deposit. I'm all in. That piece has changed. So even though we might see some multiple offers on certain properties, it's not 100% that they're going to be waiving their inspection contingency. You know, some cases will be um, on our sellers be providing a, like a pre 
pre-inspection piece to try to help buyers work through that and navigate that um, up front, try to work through some of those negotiations that you could have down the road. But we are seeing them. So the answer is yes, just not in the same frequency. And I would say before it was 90% of properties that were getting multiple offers. And I would say now it's probably closer to 10% that's receiving multiple offers. And I did some looking around um, and I found some stats from the MLS um, here that came out there for June. Um, but if I look at average days on market um, in June of 2022, so we're talking a year ago, average days on market were 34 days. And right now, um, 2023, average days on market is 57. So, you know, we're pushing, you know, a two week range more time on market because even though that there's less less supply, the demand is also down decreased as well. So it's um, extending the amount of times homes are on the market and also to some of our clients and some sellers like are really there might not be a lot of great comparables when you're pricing. So we are seeing some prices that are a little bit higher than they should be, which takes a little bit to get that down into a range where buyers are comfortable um, writing up an offer. Yeah. Um, Janeth, what are some of the main issues you see people seeking loans running into at this point and any advice? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I come across often is, you know, with the pandemic, um, all of our finances took a hit. And so there are a lot of um, buyers who are ready to purchase, but maybe there's a couple things on their credit that aren't um, the best, right? We may have um, gotten behind on some payments and things as such. So I think it's really important to start uh, monitoring that to see maybe what you can do to position you to where you're going to be able to get your the best mortgage terms possible. Thanks. Um, John, and let's put up the, the graphic of where people are relocating from at this point, if we can. Um, and this would be a question for John. Who is selling or buying at this point, given that it seems to there is a definite slowdown? Yeah. So there's a lot of folks out there right now that are strapped into their house. You know, if you were able to get, uh, you know, reasonable price either within the last like five years and a historically low mortgage rate which is making it really tough to step into that next stage, right? Even though you might really, really want to, the challenge is, am I worth, is it worth, you know, a li paying a little bit more money? Is it worth, you know, getting that extra bedroom or can we, you know, kind of hunker down and make it happen? So a lot of the clients that we're working with right now are folks that have to sell, not the ones that want to sell and buy. So. These are folks that have had uh, life life events, life changes. So that's death, divorce, relocation. Um, you know, everybody needs a roof over their head. And so when the folks, when there's challenges that happen inside a family um, or situations that change, then you get forced into an event of buying or selling. So that's a lot of what we're seeing right now is people that have to go through this process, um, not necessarily want to. It's uh, when not when everybody around is not talking about this is really fun or exciting or they feel like there's more risk around it. Um, more folks are going to roll with what everybody else is doing around them. So what we found during the pandemic was everybody started buying because I was like, that's just what everybody was doing. So everybody wanted to jump on that bandwagon. And now you're hearing that, oh, maybe you shouldn't do that. But now, and I, and I bet Janet can experience this a little bit as well, is that the more that we see people in our circle that are making the move and it's working out really well, more people will jump into it. So as we look at, especially a, a higher interest rate environment, once you have some people that you know that have gone through that and said, hey, it's not that big of a deal, right? You know, it's not really exciting to be, you know, be paying where we're at, but we can and we budgeted according to that. And we know that there will be an opportunity down the road to where we'll be able to, you know, refinance and then get our get our financials back in order. But the main people that are doing this right now is because they have to. Um, and that's why, you know, you see less less homes for sale and keep an inventory low um, and you have a little less on the buyer side. But if you look at pricing in the graph that you had there earlier, you know, there's absolutely been some changing in pricing. But you can see that it started to it's it's rebounding. If you look at um, stats in our entire MLS, so the blanket coverage is really all the Pacific Northwest up here. And every single month since the beginning of the year, 
our median price is increased every single month. So I think people are always waiting for this magic, like bottom of the market. Well, unfortunately that's probably already passed. Um, so if you're trying to get like that cheaper price, um, like what Janet alluded to earlier, that a little bit earlier in the year, people, sellers were more flexible. Sellers really wanted to try to get that property sold and were paying more credits and getting more aggressive on trying to get, get their properties sold. But it's not happening as much right now. People are practicing patience, um, which I think is really good too. So it takes out a lot of the violent swings in our pricing, you know, to have average days on market, you know, even at 34 is, you know, a month or closer to two months, we're still in a, seller's market when it comes to average days on market. So you just have to be patient. So um, that's a little bit of changes and why people are moving right now. Unfortunately, it's not for the fun stuff. It's because you got to do it. I guess. And this is um, this is kind of a, just a question that I'm thought of just now. That time on market, how does that compare nationally? Do you happen to know offhand? I don't know nationally, but my gut would tell me is that we're probably pretty good. Yeah. Um, if, you go, if you stay on the what on the coastals, you know, if you go down to California, it's definitely probably a lot um, faster days on market. So a lot less time on market in certain areas. Um, but I think that we're probably we're pretty darn insulated here. So we don't get as much of the front um, and people are always wanting to move here. We're going to get into where people are. And we talked a little bit about that now, but we there's that was people moving in here. So we do have some people that are exiting, but we're always having a constant flow of more people that are looking to move to our area. I see. Uh, for Janice, do you think we'll ever see two to three percent rates again on thirty-year loans? And when this is the million-dollar question, when do you think rate, rates will start dropping significantly, or will they? Well, you know, if you're looking at forecasts, um, they're kind of all over, right? Third quarter, um, late fall, early winter. So. The reality is nobody really knows when that's going to happen. Um, but what we do know is that it is going to start coming back. But I think it's also important to recognize that the 2 to 3% rates that we all got used to, that was the anomaly, right? That was our all-time lows. And if you've been around long enough and you were purchasing homes back in the 80s when rates were 18%, and you look at the rates now, they're really not as high, right? So um, on average, it's seven to eight percent has been the rate. And currently we're thinking that when rates do start to come back a little bit, they're going to be more around the five to six percent range. I see. And just going back a little bit um, with and this is actually for both of you, just kind of your own opinion with prices coming down and interest rates going up, are the house the way this mathematically works out, are houses any more or less affordable than they were during the peak of the frenzy? And I'll start with Janet. Okay, great. Um, well, you know, the reality is that the higher the interest rate, the higher the mortgage payment, right? It's just the way it works. Um, but when you look at what was happening two years ago and how for a lot of the homes, as John, John mentioned earlier, there was multiple offers. Um, homes were going for $50,000, $100,000 over asking price. And a lot of the times that difference that they were making, they, they were do, offering, I'm sorry, um, was made up in cash. So when you look at what the payment was then, but then you take into account how much more you paid for the home, how much of that you brought in from your reserves, and then you you look at prices now and the fact that you can refinance down the road once rates come down um it's still a good time to buy right there's it's if you're in the position to do it um it's still a really good time yeah so when i think about um you know just from a positioning standpoint and you know does it make sense you know we've we're off from the high for sure but we're starting to claw back. So when you think about affordability, you know, I look at an exercise of try without getting in trouble. So what that means is figure out, call Janet, figure out what your payment would be on this house that you would like to buy. And then figure out number one, if you can get approved for it. And then number two, act like you're making the payment now. I think the biggest thing for all of us is fear right? We all got to live somewhere. But when I think about it is, yes, rates are higher. They'll come down at some point. 
but the prices are a little down from where they were previously as well. So your strike price is always something that you lock in. The rate is something that you can always change. So I feel like right now pricing, there's still prices are off the all time high. So you can get a better strike price. But also if you're renting right now, it's probably outrageous how much you're currently spending. So when you think about that pairing, if you're renting and what the price is at, it might not be that big of a difference. But number two is it's also rent control. Like it's also pricing control. When you think about your budgeting month over month, when you're renting somewhere, you know that that's going to go up. Yes, your house payment's going to go up a little bit, but just from your property taxes and your insurance are going to change every year. So you have to factor that in a little bit, but I don't have to factor in that one, my landlord might sell this property and I'm going to have to move. Right. And if you have kiddos, like how do you, it change schools. Are you going to be able to find another place? Like, so you have to look at, are we able to adapt and adjust around that? Um, and then also too, like my rent's probably going to go up considerably. You know, when you talk about rent increases year over year, you know, there's significant, especially if you have a strategic landlord that is going to really try to push that envelope. Uh, then you, you know, you could have had a $2,000 rent a couple of years ago, and now it might be $2,800, you know, just because maybe it was, the rent was a little bit low and they got some of that money back and now they've been pushing it up. So when you talk about how much you're actually spending every month um, is a huge deal. And when I first got into the industry two decades ago, I look at why did I buy my first house? And I look at it as I wanted to start something, you know, I wanted to be able to hang my hat on something that I personally own. And I looked at modest returns. I was looking at 3% a year. I was looking at, okay, I have the opportunity to, to right now you can still deduct a really good chunk of your interest that you pay on there. So a lot of the times that ends up kind of paying for one of your mortgages after you look at your tax deduction, talk to your accountant, right? Um, but I try to look at other ways on why it made sense to do it. Um, and really just some basics um, or big pieces of it. So, you know, I think personally, if you can do it, you should always do it, but it's gotta be for you. It's gotta be for the right reasons. You wanna be excited to be able to make it happen. Yeah, and this next question for both of you and, and t speaking about renting, if, if you are renting and can't afford the current market, what can you do to position yourself for when things calm down? I know we've touched a little bit about this, but maybe we could drill down a little bit. And I'll start with Janet. I think looking at the overall picture, right? Um, John mentioned earlier, talking to all of the professionals, talk to your mortgage consultant, um, your wealth manager, you know, whomever you have in your corner, reach out to them and find out what your overall finance picture looks like. Um, Overall, I think that working, like I mentioned a little earlier, on your credit is going to be great. Um, the better the credit, the better the mortgage terms you can get. Um, working on your savings. A lot of times I have buyers who um, give me their proposed mortgage payment, what they think they're comfortable with. And it differs a little bit from what their current rent looks like. And I think it's important that when you start to think about those numbers, you start saving in advance, right? If your mortgage payment is $2,000 and you think you can go to $2,500, start putting that $500 away. Make sure that that's something that you're truly going to be comfortable with in the long run. Yeah, if um, we could get the rent comparisons on the screen just so you can see how this is, it's still, it's super expensive no matter where. And Tacoma may be a little bit of a bargain compared to elsewhere, but I mean, I can't even imagine in Bellevue right now what these people are going through. It's quite a, quite a market. Um, all right, now I'd like to start getting into some of the reader questions that we've received. Uh, Peter in Bellingham asks, um, what's the current market for condominiums and are areas more attractive for this segment than others? And John, I'll let you take that. Yeah. So the condo market's very unique, especially when you kind of have outside pressures. So, you know, when people are on the quest for affordability, there's a couple things that happen when you look at condos. Either one is going to be the, depending on where you're at, you might have the opportunity to get into a condo because of the price point that you're approved for. So you're going to have more like affordable options um, in certain areas to be able to get in to those. Now, so the challenge is, is that when you're buying a condo, is that for qualifying for a condo, you have to qualify for your uh, HOA fees inside mm -hmm. 
for your approval. So you can buy a more expensive house than you can with a condo because of the way that they calculate the loan. So you have a lot of folks that are trying to maximize their budget and get into something. Um, sometimes the condos are going to go, they're not going to be as favored as much. So when you have a fast and furious market like we've had before, when rates were really low and prices were continuing to go up, it was across the board. It was in all different areas. And, you know, you talk about a multifamily, um, also in condos and just regular single family residences, everything's just taken off. So um, when I think about condos versus houses, when the market gets challenging, and I'm talking condos versus like a single family home, like in the neighborhood, you have more folks that are always going to be geared and gravitating towards the house because if they're going to have to pay more money um they're going to try to potentially skip a step so sometimes that condos can be a building block um, in your home ownership journey to start there and then end up in a single family house so what you can what it will do is it really just continues to put pressure on condos so the challenge is that as inventory increases the days on market if we looked at if we were able to break down the stat between um, just condos and just houses single family you're going to see that on the condo side your days on market are going to be longer than the single family houses um, so when you're doing that um, if, if you're currently thinking about selling uh, really identifying and looking at your price per square foot of your unit compared to what's going on in your building. Um, very important because that's going to give you a ton of data on really what's happening. Um, also, if you have any special assessments, this is where um, a lot of folks get um, scared and, ch and, ch and challenging when you come into condos is that there's a lot of things that are out of your control. So if there's you know, a big looming special assessment, or if there's a rental cap that's met, or if it's not uh, financeable for certain types of loans, these are all just barriers of entry that get put onto condos, which again, kind of funnel people over into the single family area just because of the path of least resistance. Um, and they just wanna be able to maybe just get right into a house instead of doing that uh, building block for a condo. So um, that doesn't mean that there's no market for condos, let's be clear there. So. You just have to be priced, priced right, have the place looking right, and you got to be patient. Right now, I think that we've had years of just expectations have been unreasonable, right? What was happening, selling your house in a couple of days with a bunch of offers is just not reasonable. It's not a healthy market to be in. At the, it's like, great, if you're selling and you're leaving and you never have to do anything. But the challenge there was, too, is that there's so much going on that once you got your house sold and you got this great price, well, now what do I go buy? So a lot of the same challenges are presenting themselves now than when they were previously, but they're just packaged up a little bit differently. So my biggest thing is if you're looking to sell a condo, it's totally OK, but you really just want to be prepped behind the scenes and make sure that you're able to present it to the marketplace in a way uh, that's going to help you get the property sold. Yeah, for people looking for condos, and excuse me if I miss this, how's the inventory right now for that? We have more condo options than housing options. We do. Yeah. All right. Um, Mark in Tacoma, and we'll start with John and, and move to Janice, because I think she can add some insight to this as well. Mark in Tacoma asks, how do you price correctly in this volatile market? Yeah, it is a great question because the comparables that you have, you know, when you go back even to a sold property that was a couple months ago, the market is shifting and it's actually improving a little bit. So you have to really look at, OK, where, where was it listed at initially? How long was it on the market? Was there any adjustments in price and really get the tail of the tape on what was going on with the comparables that you're looking at? to help make the right pinpoint on where you want to price. So pricing is fluid though. Pricing is emotional. Pricing is, um, is a conversation piece. And I think that's where a lot of the um, struggle comes when you're setting proper expectations uh, is, okay, if we price it here, this is some of the, this is what we can expect, right? If you price it high, it's going to take some more time. It might not necessarily be out of the question, but does this strategy align with your goals? So, when it comes to price, it's really, you have to know what's going on. But the challenge is right now is that because we have had m many less sales than we have had pre in the last previous couple of years, um, there's not a lot of comps to go off of. So 
you and your realtor partner you need to go through and figure out, okay, this is what's going on. This is where we think the zone is like, where do we want to be? And then what is our strategy in the event that um, maybe nothing comes in? Like, how do we readdress that and make sure that we can get you to the point where you're going to get a fair price and you'll be able to get it sold in a reasonable amount of time. And all the only way that that happens is through a lot of communication. It's you got to know what the agents and the buyers are saying when they're coming to look at the property. You got to have a great open relationship with your professional partners to make sure that you can figure out open book. What is that next step for us and what makes the most sense? It's going to be hard. Like if you have to make any adjustments on your price, because we all think that our houses are amazing, right? Um, even us as realtors, I feel like we're sometimes we're the worst when we're pricing our own houses because <laughs> we just, you know, we think we can get the best, the highest value ever, but that's not necessarily the case. The price is what a buyer's ready and willing to pay for it today. Like that is the price. There's nobody, there's no institution behind that's going to pay a fair market price. It's not going to happen. So you have to be patient and wait for that right buyer to come in. But pricing is very tricky, especially if you're in a location to where there has not been any comparable sales um, in the last six months or so. It makes it tough. Um, Janet, there is one angle to that that um, I'd like for you to address, and that is, um, is it harder to get comps these days on properties? Have you noticed any kind of difficulties with that? It really just depends on the property type and also the location that you're looking at. You know, if you're looking for more rural areas, it can be. Um, but for the most part, I haven't seen a, a lot of issues with that. Um, you know, when we have appraisals come back and, and show us their comps, um, even when the pricing might not agree exactly with the value, oftentimes at that point, the realtor can come back to us and say, hey, you know, can we ask them to take a look at this versus that? And I've seen a lot of um, positive uh, changes come from that. We just got a question in. How long do you wait before adjusting your price? John, you want to tackle that? Yeah. So I feel like, uh, you know, on you got to give it a little bit of time. And I think it's not necessarily like the days on market. It's more what's the activity that you're getting? How many people are coming into the property and what are they saying? Um, and is it something that you can control or not? You know, when I think about you know, certain properties that we've sold over the years and ones that we have for sale right now, the ones that have been on a little bit longer than the others are just either properties that are super unique. And before everything was selling, unique or not, everything was selling. Right now, if you have something that's a little unique, it's going to take more time. So it necessarily doesn't mean that if you would just price it, it's automatically going to sell. So that's where you got to be cautious is if you were going to adjust the price, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Because if you make the adjustment and you don't see any activity from that, that can happen. Um, it doesn't mean that automatically everybody's going to be knocking at your door requesting for tours right out of the gate. It might move the needle a little bit or it could move it a lot, depending on what your, what your strategy is. But I would say that sometimes, you know, if you're on a short time window and you've got to make a move, then you have to push the envelope and you have to get more aggressive on your pricing and your strategy. But if you're like, Hey, I got an interesting property. It's super unique. Even when we bought it, it was on the market for a long time before we got here. So have to know what your buyer pool looks like. And then you have to wait for them to show up um, is the biggest thing. So I know that's not an exact date. If that was what you're looking for, it's like day, uh, day 26 or day 43. It just kind of depends on on where you're at and what your goals are. So, so is the, I'm just wondering when is like the discomfort level that hits you when after a time and you go, hey, this yeah. you might want to start looking at this because you know. Well, it's tough too. If you know, if you got a double mortgage payments and you've moved already, um, you know, you think about you know why you're doing it, what position you're in financially. Is it worth the wait or do you got to close the circle? And at some point in time that crossroads always comes to a head if, if you're on for a little while, but then you just have to make a decision. What do, what do you want to do? Um, Cause if you're getting, you know, activity every single week, multiple showings and you're just not getting people to write, if you've had 10 to 20 showings and no offers, it's probably a pricing issue. Oh, that's another question that I have. Has there been a lot of um, 
sellers having to, you know, like rent apartments and stuff in the meantime, kind of like in that transition, or is that a good strategy or? <laughs> yeah, well, moving twice is never fun, but for the right reasons, it can make a lot of sense. So um, yes, we do have uh, folks that will have sell, you know, you sell, move into like a short term uh, living scenario until you're either able to close on your purchase um, or you haven't found the right place. You know, especially if you have, there's not a massive amounts of options out there. Um, and we are doing more contingent offers now than we have seen in a very long time. So that's when you purchase a, you write an offer on a house that you want to buy that's contingent upon your house closing. So we are seeing more of that activity, um, which is helping. But the challenge is with that, though, is it doesn't help anybody else that doesn't already own because now you're just swapping. So it's not like we're gaining any ground on inventory or more first time buyers are able to get into properties because um, if people are going that direction, um, there's just, you know, it's you're just kind of trading um, back and forth. Now, that happens all the time. People trade, you know, their houses consist consistently. So that's always going to be something that's there. But in a low inventory market, it just continues to put more pressure on it. So I'm a big fan of the. Um, having a backup plan for the double move if you have to, mainly so you don't force yourself into buying something that you don't really want. I see. Janeth, I'm gonna give you this one. This is from Joan in Pierce County. Will 2024 be a good time to sell or buy in Pierce County? Absolutely, I definitely think that it is. Um, we are seeing more moderate prices than we did in 2020, 2021. And again, with um, hopefully lower interest rates, I think it's going to be really beneficial for a lot of people. And when you think about the appreciation that's to come, that's another plus. So yes, um, I think that ultimately the best time to purchase or sell, as it's been mentioned, is when it's right for the individual person. Um, but as a whole, it, it, it's going to be a great time. Cool. Um, Patrick in Tacoma is asking, what are the most significant reasons for low housing inventory? I think we've touched on this a little bit, but maybe John, you can enumerate them again. Yeah, it's rates. I think rate and price is just available. It's availability. You know, it's there when you're in a down inventory market, it's just, there's people are, are trapped in their house. Um, and there's not enough of it. You know, I think that's the biggest piece here too, is that, uh, back in 2000, early 2000s, um, you saw a lot of condo development. Um, now you don't see that anymore. Um, you know, especially like down in Tacoma that we've I've sold a lot of condos in downtown Tacoma, but if you notice now, the majority of that skyline are not condos for sale. Those are apartments for rent. So, and you looked at the scale earlier too, and it showed the average on the price um, where it said the rent price um, on that stat, those were the average prices for apartments. Those are not the average prices for houses. So I would say that if you look at those, you could probably have to increase those by at least 50% when you think about how much you're gonna be able to rent a house for. So it is expensive to rent, it's expensive to own living in our area. You know, you have the 10 best weeks of the country here in the summertime and then you're going to pay for that so people want to be here our job market is good so the more people that we have that continue to come here the harder and harder it's going to get and we definitely have people leaving but not enough um, we do not have enough uh, even in the pipeline to get anywhere close to catch up with the demand for our area so that's just going to continue to push up pricing um, and you're going to also you might have to look at just changing your goals a little bit, you know, when it comes to, Hey, I, we have X and we'd really like, you know, four bedrooms, but we could get away with three or one and a half baths versus three baths. Like you might have to bring down some of your expectations to get into a zone that works for your price point. Um, but that's not forever. Right. I think that ultimately it's being in a, in a location that you enjoy, that you want to be in uh, for yourself, for your family, for your fun, um, all those things. So, uh, unfortunately, the even is always going to be. I don't think there's ever going to be a plethora of inventory, um, whether that's for rent or for purchase, um, outside of the condo or outside of the apartment um, realm. But even that's tight too. So, but if you need a place to rent and you have to find a place, that's probably going to be your best bet right now. 
John Stain, with that, are you are you still seeing a lot of full cash offers at this point? Or I mean, there was always the talk of oh, the California buyers are coming in and paying cash for everything, and it's ruining. Yep. It. Is this still happening? It is, uh, but not like it was before. So we have definitely run across it and been involved in a number of cash purchases um, this year. But um, before it was the cash purchase over list, like we're just going to smoke everybody and get this property. Now what we're starting to see is like the old, the cash buyers of old, which are I'm coming in and I'm going to be really aggressive on price. And now I'm trying to find a deal. So the cash offers that we have are not, um, you know, are not those usually the best offers to take anymore. It's nice not to have any contingencies around the financing piece of it, but there's just not as much. Um, also, too, because the stock market is doing great this year, you can get a lot of a lot more money on your on your uh, money just sitting in the bank than you have in a long time. So I think some of those folks are just looking at if I am going to go out and buy something cash, I got it. I need to get a better deal. Um, and so so the answer is yes, but not nearly as much. Um, I would say that we're seeing that probably in about five percent of the offers that we that we look at so and that's pretty significant compared to i would say that we'd see some stuff you know over the last couple of years it was over 50 percent of the amount of offers were even if it wasn't a cash offer from the um, buyer they had some ability to come up with the cash uh, to be able to close wow yeah so um Dana in Boise is asking, is it a buyer's or seller's market at this point? And if neither, what would become the tipping point? And I'd kind of like both of you to take a run at that. Um, Jana, if you can add your thoughts and then um, we'll go to John. I think based off of what we're seeing right now with still competitive offers um, in the inventory, definitely leaning towards still a seller's market. Um, even though home prices we are seeing start to become a little bit more uh, moderate, um, until we get more inventory out there, I think it's going to be a seller's market. But I think that John might have a better insight on that one. It's definitely, we're still leaning towards the seller side. Um, you know, once we start trending like days on market, um, three, four, five months at that point in time, uh, you would for sure be tipping over into a buyer's market as you're going to have much more um, upside as a buyer because, you know, that just means that it's taking longer for people to sell their houses and also is going to really start impacting pricing. If you see prices that houses that have been on the market for four, five, six months, they're probably more willing to look at, at offers than the one that's been on for six days. So as more properties over, over the whole of the market continue to get more days on market, that is going to lead towards more opportunities for buyers to get in there. So, you know, as we're talking and going through our consultations with our buyers up front, it's like, okay, what is your level of comfort, you know, going in right away, especially if you go into a house, you still see it now, you know, it's three days on market and there's 30 business cards that are in there. Well, there's probably a good shot. That one's going to have a lot of activity on it. So are you willing to do that? Are you comfortable with what it's going to take? Or do you need to pull back? And at that point, um, just wait a little while for that right deal. And again, this is where the unique property comes into play. You know, when the stuff that before everything was selling, now there just could be something a little off. Could be, a, you know, the location could be off a little bit. The way it lays on the lot could be a little off. The, the neighboring house might not be as nice. Um, there's all these small little things that everybody was willing to overlook before, um, but are now not, people are not. So those type of houses as you're going out and um, shopping and, and looking to purchase um, are ones you might have a little bit more success on with uh, getting a little bit better value, uh, which in turn will help out uh, you know, with your payments overall every single month. And when the market does heat up again, if you are looking to sell, um, you know, depending on what's going on at the time, uh, it could be a little bit easier for you at that point. Or again, what your goals are. You know, right now it's if you had a, if you're looking to buy and sell, you know, I would counsel a, a current client, you know, have you thought about, you know, I know you really want to move, but, you know, your payments X and your rent would be this, right? So what's the difference? So 
if you have an extra thousand dollars a month coming off your rental income and you push that over into a payment right now, now would that be able to qualify for or comfortability feel good about upgrading to a new home? And that's why I've been somebody like Janet um, and a real estate professional like myself to be able to look at, okay, like here's you could sell it for, here's what you'd make. Hypothetically, if you were to push that over and get a mortgage right now, what does that look like? Then you can look at the whole picture and make an educated decision. But I think having great data to make good decisions is important in any market. But right now, I think that there's some opportunity out there that people are just not looking into. So here's a, no, a new question. How is all this impacting first time buyers and what programs are out there to support them? And I'll give that to Janet. Well, again, with the higher interest rates, it makes a difference on the mortgage payment. So yeah, a lot of people are in a position where even if they'd like to buy, sometimes that payment is just a little bit higher for comfort. Um, so there are programs out there, including um, Washington State Housing Finance Commission has a down payment assistance program. Um, it's a really good option for people who might not have the initial funds to get into a home. So um, always something to look into. There are also just lower um, down payment option mortgages, such as like FHA loans. Um, conventional loan has one as well for first time buyers. So there's definitely a lot of options. Um, talk to your mortgage consultant, you know, let us know kind of what your goals are, um, what what your finances are, and we can help you put together a plan to get you into a home. I've got another question for Janice. Um, how are appraisals going in this market? Are they, are they coming okay or there's some just like woo this is not working out for this long well i think that agents um, realtors have done a really good job of pricing homes and because of that right now we have not really seen a big um, difference in appraised value versus um, listed value i think that that's something that everybody is kind of coming to terms with is where the market is and that it's not 2020 2021 right you you can't really expect to sell your home for the same value that your neighbor might have at the time so i think they've done a really good job and it's really um, shown with the appraisals Wow. Yeah. I remember um, back 2015 or so, it was always a nail biter because <laughs> we were just coming out of kind of the slump and then going back and people were starting to raise their prices. It was just, oh, wow. Is this, are we going to get our loan or what? You know, but um, John, are you seeing many people uh, waiving inspections at this point or is that a thing of the past? You know, I, there's a couple of things that are going on is one, depending on the property um, and what's going on, we're still seeing a lot of uh, pre-inspections on properties. So depending on the um, circumstances and what the overall goals are of the client, um, there's a lot of the times that we'll um, do a, an inspection before we actually list the property that you provide to the buyer. So at that point, they can make a decision um, and try to, for this for the seller, it's beneficial to try to be able to get through that contingency so you know that they're okay and there's not going to be any red flags um, and they're going to be willing to move forward. So um, when there's a pre-inspection that's in place, there is about a 50 to 75 percent um, that they'll either waive the inspection or they'll try to negotiate with the findings just right up front, um, which is nice uh, because as a seller, you just don't know. Like you, you're excited to get your uh, an offer on your house and come to terms, uh, but then you're just super nervous because you don't know what's going to happen after that. And in an inspection contingency, um, it's really a get out of jail free card. So you can just change the buyer can just change their mind for any reason. So it really leaves a seller vulnerable um, in our state and a lot of the majority of states. A lot of the contract law and offers is really going to favor the buyers. So you just have to know and again be able to counsel through that piece. So. If you have a pre-inspection up front, there's probably a pretty good likelihood um, that you'll be able to get through that inspection uh, process a, a bit easier. Now, not everybody's going to want to do that. One, it costs money. Two, um, there is, you know, maybe there's stuff that you just don't know and you would rather not know. Um, so there's sometimes that that just doesn't, it, you know, you feel like that wouldn't be beneficial um, to do that piece and let the buyer, um, you know, take on that piece of the puzzle and, and get their own inspection moving forward. So the answer is a little bit. We see a little bit of wave inspections, but not a ton. If you got a really good area though, and you're priced really well, um, and you get one of those opportunities that you have a, 
um, multiple offers. We are still seeing some inspections waived at that point. But again, we're talking 10% um, of properties that we're seeing right now are kind of having that type of an outcome um, when they go on market. Are home warranties worth it at this point? Home warranties are so tricky. Um, it depends. They're, I've seen times that they are absolute home runs um, to where it has been an amazing benefit for the client. Um, you know, it just depends on the house you're buying. I think that whether or not, though, if it's new or old, the one thing that we have found is that when you change the way that the house is lived in, that is when you're going to have the most opportunity for things to break. So if you have a house that was experiencing very little wear and tear, say with two people living in the house and then they sell and now there's six people living in the house. This just takes all of your systems constrained to a level that they're not used to. So even when they're not that old, um, you can see challenges and your and with plumbing issues and with your furnace, you know, it's like if somebody keeps it at 68 all the time and then in the winter time, you know, somebody else moves in and they got it at 75. Well, that system is working completely differently. So the home warranty is nice because you're covered for a certain amount of time to be able to get some of those appliances either um, repaired at no cost or little cost. So it can never hurt, but if you rely on it, um, you know, there might be certain things that you thought would be covered that aren't covered either. Um, so you really just, if you're going to utilize a home warranty, make sure you're very clear on what's getting covered and what the process looks like. Um, and then most times you got to practice some patience because they're not really excited. It's kind of like, it's just like insurance. So you have to, uh, you might need to make a couple extra phone calls. It's probably not going to be as white glove as we would um, like to have, but that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Janif, anything to add to that? You had any Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, we purchased a new build home and we are, like John said, finding that there's certain things that just aren't covered. And there's certain things that we've come up with the um, with the warranty that, you know, we, we would have thought we wouldn't need done now. Right. It's a brand new home. So I think there's definitely value to it, um, but definitely you need to know what it covers and, and have those expectations. Yeah. Yeah. I've always wondered about that because when you're going through the checklist and they go, well, you know, you could do a home warranty. And I was like, is that worth it or what? I just don't know. So, you know, so many questions, it's overwhelming, you know, when, yeah. you, when you get into this, you know? So uh, one more question, we're about coming down to the close of our hour, but for John, how have out of state buyers affected this market? Are, are they still doing it at this point? I know we've touched on this a little bit, but can you drill down and like, which states are you seeing really having kind of an impact in terms of buying? Yeah. So I see a lot of like back, like right now, if you look at who's, where are people coming and going? And I think a lot of the people, the, the two big areas that we have people coming from, at least that we're noticing here a lot on our team um, is Texas and California. Um, and I think that's really a lot of that is, uh, is tech based work is still, still here. Um, so that's where we see a lot of people coming in from. Um, I've seen a lot of, a lot of people too, over the last couple months, uh, people that moved during the pandemic and thought that they were not going to have to come back into the office and that now uh, has changed. So we have definitely had uh, folks moving back uh, because they have to, because they have to get closer to work. Um, they're no longer um, being allowed to work, work remotely full time. So, you know, if you moved to uh, Idaho or Montana and you had a job here, um, you know, we're getting some people that are having to come back from that. Um, but areas out of here, though, it's like I feel like people are going all over the place. You know, it's the, the retirees that are getting out of here, um, a lot of people, it's like East Coast um, or close in. So with, and that would be like Eastern Washington, Idaho, Montana. Um, a lot of folks moving in that direction um, that still like, you know, everything evolves and changes. So um, we're going to have certain times where people are more are leaving than are coming um, and other times where it's flip-flopped and everybody's going to go all over the place. I think that the amazing part about the country that we live in is that you can get really anywhere you want to go. You know, yes, you got to get on a plane. It's not great, but you can absolutely make it happen. So it's opened up like all of these different areas for people to go explore. So 
I hope that over time, maybe some of the places that don't have as many people traveling to them, there's more people moving to maybe more unique locations, um, you know, spreading it out, but also making it more interesting. So, um, but there's absolutely people still um, coming in and going. Yeah. Janet, how, what are you seeing in your office? Are you seeing um, out of state buyers still? Absolutely. A lot of relocation and for military reasons as well. You know, we here in the Tacoma University Place area have a lot of um, people coming in from to, to JBLM, the base. So we're definitely seeing a lot of people relocating, as John Marty mentioned, um, now going back to the office, right? People are looking to move. They might have thought that they could be a little bit further away. And now they want to get closer to the office. So it's definitely relocation is a huge thing we're seeing. Cool. All right. Well, in our final minutes, is there any last thoughts either one of you have or any topic that we didn't cover that you'd like to hit on? I think I just hope that one of the key takeaways for people um, watching is, you know, get informed, talk to your realtor, talk to your mortgage professional, find out all the information, right? Even if you think that you're not in a position to buy today, still talk to us because we might be able to put a plan in place for you so that we can get you ready, right? The best time to do this isn't when you're 30 to 60 days away from your lease ending. You want to have all the information in advance. That way, you know where you're headed. Yes, I would agree. That's number one, because I feel like all of us um, have real estate apps on your phone and everybody loves looking at real estate. It's one of those things. So the challenge will be is that if, if you're not, you will find something when you're not ready and it might be the one, but you haven't done what's necessary behind the scenes to actually pull the trigger. So what ends up happening is that you shop, even though you maybe shouldn't be shopping, you find the dream house that now becomes the compar the comparison house that you weren't able to take a swing at that might not ever come back again. So get prepared, get prepared early, and then start looking. And even if it's just for fun, right? When you're looking just for fun, but you know you can, then if that opportunity does strike, it's just so much easier to make that decision and so much less stressful. It's already such a big change a new chapter and when you're going into that with your you know you're inside you're scared you're nervous you're excited all those things um but then also when you don't have a mortgage dialed in then it makes it just magnifies all of that so for sure behind the scenes and then the one thing for the sellers is that i have so many clients that i go in and um they do all this work to get their house looking sharp, all the things that they put off when they live there. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be really expensive, but it's like, you know, painting inside, getting the outside just really dialed in, get your yard looking nice, or, you know, doing this one little upgrade here or there. Um, and there's so many times that uh, we'll get pictures and we'll send them to the client and they'll be looking at marketing materials. And they're like, man, this place looks amazing. I wish we would have done this three years ago when we started talking about it. So do the things now that you really want, as long as you can afford it, do them now. Don't wait so that you can get the opportunity to spend the time in your house with all the things that you really wanted to do. And then when it does come time to sell, you don't have to do all that work then either. So um, I, we push off a lot of things. Life goes fast for, you know, incredibly fast um but put a little love into where you're at and enjoy it you got to spend a lot of time there um so you know don't don't wait to do those small projects that you continually push off that's right we, uh, boy i can attest to that we've added a deck and remodeled our bathrooms at our house it's like the best things we ever did <laughs> i spend more time on the deck now than i do inside my house so that's yeah um, can't wait to do the kitchen but that'll be a whole other <laughs> in time <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, we're just about out of time and I want to thank our panelists for joining us today and thank you for watching and following along. Um, and uh, just to add, our ability to keep you informed about the area's real estate market depends on your support. And if you like this event, please consider supporting local journalism by subscribing at thenewstribune.com. Thank you so much.